Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, G.V.A. Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, John Katsimatidis, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, the Moining Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. You know, New York City is a city of unique characters, individuals who make up this city. And real estate has this great group of unique individuals. And today I have the executive chairman of um, First Service Williams, Bob Friedman. So, Bob. <laughs> characters, uh, characters. Characters, yeah. true characters, true characters. So, you know, I, we always try to not divulge the age, but you're 60 years of age. You're going to be 61. And you were born, you told me, at Doctor's Hospital, right? I was born, yes. Born at Doctor's Hospital. Born, born at Doctor's uh, Hospital, but like any real estate play, now it's a, they changed the purpose. Well, the way, the, the way I think of Doctor's Hospital, it yeah. traded for $750 per square foot, so it was, and uh, it was a conversion, and now it's a now it's luxury okay. condominium. So you, yeah. you were born there, you lived in Forest Hills, and then you moved, um, you grew up in Malvern. And you I grew up in Malvern and, and then later Rockville, Rockville Center. Center. Right. And you graduated uh, Malvern High School, and then you decided to go to the small little college in Pennsylvania, right? Yes, Franklin and Marshall. Franklin and Marshall, where you were a history major. Correct. And during the summers, especially <clears throat> since you really liked, and we'll find out about it, you really liked the, the radio business and the TV, but the TV wasn't that big at that time. Um, you worked for the legendary Marty Glickman. I worked for Marty Glickman. And I was the, quote, producer. He had a call-in show. Producer of the call-in show, yeah. just like the Stoller Reporter. Right. Just so, like, so, so I'd what have to happens? scream calls. Okay, so yeah. now you graduate, uh, and... What do you do? What well, I went to Washington University, I, Washington University in St. Louis. I went to law school. No, you went yeah. for one semester over there. Uh, and decided I did not want to be a lawyer. And I actually did well academically, but that was irrelevant. Uh, so, so here, you know, it's interesting. Real estate, brokerage, building of the city, a lot of these properties, you, you've had such a big involvement. You now decide to become in that show, just like in Bravo, like Madman, you go to work for the advertising business. I went to gray, gray advertising. What are you doing in gray advertising? I was in media. And it was actually a very good background because it was uh, uh, marketing driven. And in media, remember, I majored in history. Uh, I wasn't that fluent with numbers. And I had to get immersed in numbers. Uh, uh, reach, frequency, GRPs, you know, I'm dealing in metrics. Uh, and I got very fluent which has been of inestimable value in the business that I'm in. So, but I got very manipulative with numbers, so, which so, is part of what we do. So, so you yeah. leave Gray and you go to BD, BBDNO, the big, the big 800-pound gorilla. And one of the things that you're involved with over there is the Burger King account. Yes, I went to, uh, as long as we're uh, 
detailing our academic credentials here. I went to we Whopper, Whopper College, uh, where I didn't... In Florida, probably. In uh, Carl Gables, that's exactly right. And uh, I, le I learned uh, uh, how to prepare uh, all of the uh, delectables. So, so they now, say, you know, the interesting yeah. thing, now you're about 24, 25 years of age, and you're making, at that time, a lot of money. I think you were up to, like, $20,000. You had, you had started at $6,500, got to $20,000, and then something happens. You're, you're, you're at a, a party or something, and your, your future father-in-law, who you didn't know was going to be your future father-in-law. No, I was dating, you were dating my wife Milton, at the time. Okay, and, uh, uh, you, you, you run into this individual, the legendary... Well, my, my father-in-law, Felix Fertig, was there, and he gave a party. He was very socially friendly with a gentleman named Norman Levy, who was the chairman of Cross and Brown, which was one of the dominant players in our industry. And he was of legendary proportion. No question. Norman. And we were just discussing, what do you do? I said, I'm in advertising. He said, that's a good career. He says, I'm in real estate. It's been, it's been a great career. It's the last outpost of entrepreneurialism. It's something you should consider. And I remember him saying to me, he said, you, you have the skill set for this. You should very seriously consider it. And he said, fortunately, your uh, date's father at the time, Felix Ferdi, he's, he's a senior uh, broker at uh, Williams. Speak to him. So now, yeah. fast forward, you know, pay, let's go not forward, pass back. 35 years ago, this March, March 4th, I will have been at what, it, what is now First Service Williams. So, so you go to work years. for this company yes. called Williams & Company, which was founded by Victor Cohn. Victor Cohn. And uh, at that time, Victor's still alive. His son, uh, Jerry, Victor is there. Victor was alive. His, Victor was uh, the chairman. His son was president. And Bob Carmel was the executive vice president, and Ed Roos was the executive vice president. And you go there, and th this company has been you know, been around since the 30s. But you know, I think just before you got there, they were involved with the uh, assemblage of one dog Hamishaw Plaza. They were involved with that. And then uh, they were also involved with the assemblage of 1700 Broadway. They were. Which is a building that you worked in at that time, right? Yes. They so, had also done the uh, Avon deal. Uh, 723,000 square feet, which at the time was the largest leasing transaction in North America. Right, at that's 9, at 9 West, West 57, 57 Street. Street. So, uh, so now, what do you do there? I mean, you're an advertising guy. You're a history major. You're advertising guy. Now you're, now you're a loft broker? No, I was never a loft broker. I was an office broker. So, uh, and in fact, they were making the, the strong transition from loft legal, brokerage to, to, office. to office brokerage. Uh, so it's basically a desk and a phone, and uh, uh, we then had a sales manager who was a character. When you when you when you uh, feature characters in this industry, a gentleman named Jack Fader, you remember that name? He was our sales manager. L little uh, training programs, little or no training programs. Not the, a the, lot. The, the of training, training programs was walking around, learning with Bob Carmel, your father-in-law, yes. and other people over there. Right. So, but in a short period of time, by the time you were 35. Uh, which now is the 25th anniversary, uh, you were made the... Uh, I was made a partner. Made a partner. The only... David Levinson and I were made partners in that era. We were the first partners. Uh, Bob Carmel had been the first non-family member to be designated a partner. So now, yeah. you know, you, we were talking about notable deals and transactions, and I think one of the most notable deals and transactions that you were involved with is the famed D&D building, which won the ingenious deal of the year for the real estate board. Tell, tell my audience what that deal was. The D&D building was a to-the-trade building for design resources, home furnishings. Uh, a lot of people would know it, uh, uh, Brunswick, Stark Carpet, Cowton and Tout. It, it, it's the equivalent of luxury goods retail, except it's to the trade. And it emerged as a legendary building in New Across York. Across the street from uh, Bloomingdale's? Across the street from Blo Bloomingdale's, exactly. And Aaron Diamond was the developer. Um, we were losing market share uh, there was a building in Long Island City, you will recall. Right, uh, the, the, IDC, designs, the, the IDC. The IDC NY. Which in the former Chicklets factory. In the former Chicklets factory, exactly. And 
they identified the D&D building as the target if they could induce um, a critical mass of tenancy to relocate to Long Island City, uh, it would have been the death knell for the building, and Long Island City would have emerged as the design resource for New York City. And I remember people, that everybody said the van, you know, you take over the 59th Street Bridge, or you could take the train. This was the great thing. This was, the IDC was going to be the panacea for the, for the furniture business. Everybody wanted to be there. Right. And Unfortunately, it was probably 20 years ahead of its time. Well, not only that, you had a little uh, shuttle. That's right. They had shuttle buses on 56th Street, right outside of uh, 919 Third Avenue. But remember, it was across the river. There was an image deficit. And what they did is they enrolled a lot of the key players in the industry who became invested in this project. They wanted a low-cost provider. They thought they had been gouged by the D&D building. So they, they had a, a seriousness of purpose. They, they were going to uh, right, but how do you relocate? How, I mean, we were talking when we got together. You can't deliver. You made you made this building unique. You, you changed the the way of a standard office building. You made this a building within a building. That's why this won the Ingenious Award. Well, what a lot of the major tenants were telling me is, this is a historical inevitability. They're going to relocate to Long Island City, and I said. Well, you have to do this en masse. I mean, unless you establish a critical mass, there were certain leasing requirements before the deal went h hard. They had merely signed letters of intent. And I knew that this whole communal ethic was not really sustainable. Uh, if I could unbundle them uh, and they would each act in their enlightened self-interest, this mythology of the IDCNY would, uh, would erode and erode very quickly. So I structured some transactions with very concessionary pricing to induce some of the what I called bellwether tenants uh, either to attract them to the building or to retain their tenancy. In one instance, we rolled back the rent to levels of 15 years ago. But the deal that, that I was awarded the most ingenious transaction went to Clarence House, who had a uh, uh, townhouse on East 57th Street. And to them, the D&D building was day class A. They were on 57th Street between Madison and Park. And I said to them, what if I could create a building within a building, a townhouse, but a townhouse where each floor stepped out? So you had 2,000 square feet on the ground floor, but by the time you got to the fourth tier, you might have 10,000 square feet. Much more efficient to display your wares. And the intrinsic problem with any townhouse, they were in a townhouse that was uh, 25 feet. Uh, it was on a plot 25 by 100, probably built 80. So the vertical stack yielded a very inefficient utilization of space. So the gentleman's name, I think the CEO was Robin Roberts same name as a pitcher on the Philadelphia right. Phillies in the, the early Phillies. 50s, the Whiz Kids. Uh, he uh, was intrigued. I could see he was intrigued. We did took him there, did the deal, structured the deal with concessionary pricing. I remember we capped escalation for a 10-year period, which was almost unprecedented in that era. Uh, but that enabled the building to establish critical mass, and then we uh, were able to... Uh, right deals with smaller tenants at very, very high margins, and uh, the, the building became robustly uh, profitable again. Uh, another deal, you know, from, let's say, from the Pillars of Ashes that turned really great was the Candler Building on 42nd Street, 220 West 42nd Street. The Candler Building was, was the only building on the street, on 42nd Street. Which had history because that was Coca-Cola, right? The Candler family, I mean, as it was related to me, uh, there was a son, an heir, a Candler heir, who was a ne'er-do-well. So the father, who was clearly a senior executive at, uh, at Coca-Cola, what do I do with my ne'er-do-well son? I have a concept. Real estate. <laughs> we'll, we'll migrate him to real estate. Real estate How much he, damage he, can he do? Right. He made damage over no. there in Times Well, Square. actually, there are two or three Candler buildings. There's another Candler building in Phoenix, all the same family. But you're right. It's the, the uh, Coca-Cola family. So, so here we are at 220 West 42nd Street. 
in the height of one of the worst times, nearly as bad as the time that you went into the real estate business in 1974, that here's a building that was being taken back by the bank, correct? Uh, it was, uh, well, t technically, it was uh, Mass Mutual. And Mass Mutual uh, foreclosed, or it was a prepackaged bankruptcy, and they wrote, wrote the asset down to six million dollars. Now this is 42nd Street. We had some very marginal tenancy. Uh, we had arms dealers. You know, we, we, we had marginal would be a nice term. Uh, <laughs> this was uh, this skewed uh, from I, my I, advertising I, background. Down market. This right. was down scale. Yeah, yeah, you know, this <laughs> was you know, true. You know, you needed arms dealers in that location you, you in the did. mid '90s, in the early '90s. And this was the only building that was outside of the new 42, which was the quasi-governmental agency. So there it is, uh, 24 stories. Uh, next to the New Amsterdam Theater, which you will recall was lavishly restored to its former grandeur by Disney, and it, it, it was starting to evolve. So they write it down to a non-performing asset, six million dollars. They get an offer for eighteen million dollars to sell the asset. I said um, I wouldn't be a first-generation profit taker. Uh, and remember, Mass Mutual was the same uh, enterprise that sold the Chrysler building. Remember, they had the They had the same situation on the Chrysler building. Before it ripened, and there was such a steep run-up in value subsequent to that sale. Uh, so now I invoked that doctrine, so by you, the way. So, so what yeah. happens is you had to create something unique to get people to be interested. I mean, the Disney was opening in the New Amsterdam Theater. There was no question. Madame Tussauds was opening up over there. There were other things. This but, was actually but this prior was a, to that. I agree. This was all prior. Right, yeah. but this was a building which was in a neighborhood that hadn't reached its peak in 1994 or 1995. But as this regentrification was starting to take hold, here we are, 24 stories, a boutique office building. It would require a massive renovation. And the more due diligence we did, there was a lot of karma here. It was not part of uh, landmark status. It wasn't a New York City designated landmark, but it was part of the National Registry of Historic Places. It would be eligible for tax credits. And the more I started to dwell on this, it could emerge as a retailtainment base in a boutique office building atop, and having written it down to six million dollars, uh, you start to do the math, uh, the potential for creating significant value here. So, uh, so how do you finally uh, find really Francis Silliman? What we did is we decided we were going to single source all of the advertising in one media vehicle. and we developed a, a pop-up, and we took the streetscape, and at first it was rendered in a very literal transcription, and I looked at it, and it just didn't resonate. And then I thought of uh, Red Grooms, a lot of the whimsical, cartoonish depictions of, of the city, and I said, look, what are we selling? We're selling 42nd Street. We're selling cacophony. You're selling the rhythm and the pace of New York. And as a result, we had the advertising agency render it in a very whimsical mode. And it was a pop-up, and we put it in, uh, I always forget whether it was Variety or Billboard. I think it was Variety. And it was a spread. And it's the Bible of the entertainment industry. It was a $135,000 budget, single-sourced. Every senior executive read it. We received calls from... Uh, uh, Disney from what was then known as SFX and we wrote the deal they decided to take the building in its entirety yeah. and, th and then I did a little mapping because the uh, uh, Bob Sillerman one of his best friends was the leading McDonald's franchisee and they were what do we do with the base and uh, the largest McDonald's right. uh, it's the largest McDonald's in, in the, the world, world is, and also probably one of the most profitable McDonald's in the world um, not necessarily. Yeah, because, because of the rent. Be, because of the rent. The rent is not in line, but I would look at it as corporate image advertising. In, in other words, 
it it's, you know, generates a lot, a high level of awareness. You, you know, a dollars. couple of things yeah. uh, before we talk about some other deals. You know, I think your dad said to you, your mother and dad who are alive. Uh, which they is are alive. Who, it's wonderful. Yeah. I said they yeah. are. They are alive. Your father, when, when you went into this business, I think he said to you, and it was a terrible time, that it's the best to go into the worst time of business. To, never to be in a bear market. It's uh, into a bear. Uh, it's never bull market, a bull never market to, yeah. to, but to be a bear market. And that's what he said. But what about this thing, this sign, this Zorb of the Greek sign in your office, which relates to how well, maybe we do business? Well, I still don't know how you that, but I'm, I, I suppose there are leak, leaks in the, in the office. I mean, no, no, people it was, have it to was learn in to an be discreet. Was, was it in an, an article? It was in an article. That's a... Um, we're in a business that is very entrepreneurial. And someone asked me, when you manage brokers, how do you manage brokers? They are uh, ungovernable by their very nature. Uh, a lot of them, myself included. In fact, uh, one temp once said to me, are you ADHD? Uh, and I said, uh, yes, she had observed me for about three minutes. And uh, I said, why, what do you do? She said, well, I, I teach uh, ADD children in second grade, and you, Mr. Friedman, are a poster child. So we have a lot of ungovernable people, people with uh, short tempers. How do you manage them? And it dawned on me that, yes, a lot of people in our industry are creative, but there is a madness that attends it. And to be perfectly frank, I forgot verbatim what this Zorba the Greek I proverb says. But it, it, it has to do, you must have a little bit of madness. And uh, frankly, so, so, so that relates since, to, so since that I know a lot of clinically okay, so, deranged people, so, so myself that, so, included, so that you really, better have madness. Okay, so that also now relates to you and your partners owning some property. I mean, one of them, perhaps, people would say, Home Depot opened up in the city. But to open up on 23rd Street, that could have been madness, but it's been a great success. Your prop, your home, the Home Depot development that you did it's, in Chelsea. It's, it's interesting because what they had to do is Home Depot had a prototype. And when you think about it, when, when you go from a horizontal footprint to a vertical footprint, they literally have to reinvent the store. So it shows you how these big box users Home Depot is a classic example of an early uh, adopter to an urban context. And those that have been able to adopt will, will fare very well in this time. And then another small lease, or major lease, I'm only being facetious, was to Broadway, which, as you said, everybody one day or other has been into Broadway. So the That's MTA is a great lease. story. I mean, every time anyone I meet someone in Wall Street, they were uh, uh, there. This was a deal with the MTA. Uh, leased the building in its entirety. Uh, it was a very challenging market. Uh, Tom Sapir, uh, who came to this country uh, from Russia as a, uh, a taxi, he drove a cab. Um, he, no, he originally this, started in the electronics business. Did he start in the electronics, electronics business? Electronics business and cab. Uh, so he buys this asset, 1.6 million square feet. Uh, just to put it in perspective, you know, a market like Philadelphia probably has 20 million, 25 million square feet of Class A office space. This is uh, um, uh, approaching 10 percent of that inventory. This building, 1.6 million, Merrill Lynch had been in the building. Olympia and York had owned this asset. You know, a storied and fabled building, uh, vacant. Buys it for 11 million. It accretes to 18 million. Uh, and we did a deal with the MTA. Uh, it was a 49-year deal. It was the aggregate rental value was well in excess of one billion dollars. It was one of the largest transactions in the city, and the building was refinanced for approximately 280 million dollars. So this not, is not, 11 not a, million to 280. You know, I you want know, to talk about another talk about deal. wealth we, creation. Right, we, we haven't had. We don't have too much time, but. Take the Mass Mutual. The Mass Mutual, they had an offer for 18 million, and then subsequently they sold it for 169. 165, 169. 165, right. Five. So now another interesting building. It's also Lower Manhattan. Was 195 Broadway, the former AT&T building, which you leased to Thompson. Uh, we we leased that to uh, uh, Thompson Financial. They consolidated about 17 offices. 
from Midtown, Midtown South, and, uh, and downtown. And these are the buildings that are part of the fabric of New York. This was the former AT&T headquarters building, um, the, the lobby, which has been featured in, uh, in uh, uh, film. Uh, looks like uh, a steel from a Greek temple. You know, the, the columns, it's stately. Looks like a secular cathedral. Right, I, I mean, but even uh, besides that, uh, you know, you had, you and your partners have been responsible for the ABC carpet building on Broadway. Yes. I mean, that's one well, we, we We um, own uh, one of the buildings. They cobbled together a few buildings. And AB, ABC carpet has thrived. ABC uh, carpet's right. an institution. And, and, the, uh, the Flatiron building, uh, 655 Madison 655 Avenue. 655 Madison is a uh, boutique office building, which is, uh, uh, frankly, uh, probably the low-cost provider in the Plaza District for direct space today. So, so with like a minute and a half left, yeah. a couple of points. Uh, your wife is in the art gallery business. My wife is the president of Nodler & Company, which is the oldest gallery in continuous operation in New York, established in 1846. Your daughter, 22? Um, my, my daughter is 22. She's working in uh, um, uh, so the Green. sustainability the sustainability industry. The best way I would describe my daughter, uh, so high social responsibility, and uh, charming also, but high social responsibility index, and I think she has green in her future, as, and, as and, do we all, hopefully. Right. And your dad, you know, a true entrepreneur who started in the toy dropping and everything and then Times Square store, he and your mom, thank God, are alive. They're alive, they're uh, thriving. They're thriving. And oh. before I end, mentors in your life. Mentors in my life, um, both my parents. Um, um, for my father, uh, his, his entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, my mother, frankly, at the risk of immodesty, her style and her elegance. Uh, so uh, I think I'm a product of both of them. My father-in-law, clearly uh, a successful broker, a very, very good model. Um, and Bob uh, Carmel. And Bob Carmel, who uh, no question. when I started, uh, he had a world of you. Okay. He got it. I would like to say this has been a great show, a very interesting story of a true builder of New York, and thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, G.V.A. Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, John Katsimatidis, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, the Moynihan Group.